Good morning, New Baltimore. It's a great day to be in the house of the Lord, isn't it? Amen. Amen. Let's open with prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this is the day that you have made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. We thank you that we can freely worship you, Lord, and and come to a house of worship and uh, just receive from you, from what you have for each of our individual lives. Lord, speak to each of us, Lord, this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. My name is Vince Rosnack. We uh, live in Uniontown. I am married to Pam for over 30 years now. Uh, We don't have any children. I am a financial advisor for Edward Jones Investments. Uh, At church, I'm involved in a lot of different lay activities, uh, the missions team, uh, and help out wherever I can help. And right now, I'm facilitating the Financial Peace University class, which is going to be ending next week, and then we'll be discussing when to have the next round of classes. Uh, I guess one hobby or, or fact to an, uh, my favorite scripture is, or one of them, Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Right. Visitors, we want to welcome you here and also online. We don't believe you're here by accident. Uh, we have been praying for you to come and worship God with us. We'd love to get to know you better if you'd tell us a little bit about yourself in front of you. There is a yellow card that looks like this. Put your information down on that card, uh, and then you can place the yellow card in a sign-up basket just outside the door as you leave the sanctuary, or give it to Pastor Ken, and he will give it to the appropriate persons. These yellow cards are also used for the entire church family. You can place prayer requests or special needs that you might have on those as well, and then just drop those off in the same place. Our announcements are in the bulletin, and the Friday weekly emails that you get from the church. I don't know about you, but I like that Friday email. It it just updates me on everything that's happening in the church. Please check them out, and if you are streaming, you can find the bulletin on our website. Announcements. We have Senior Sunday coming up next Sunday. We're going to be holding a graduate recognition for the senior class of 2022 here in the church. Uh, Elena Goldstein, Noah Graham, Michael Hetrick, and Dylan Puckett are all going to be uh, recognized next Sunday. Another announcement, uh, Mike Hetrick's open house, June 5th, Sunday, June 5th. All are welcome to celebrate uh, from 1 to 5 at Wingfield Lake State Park at the Lakefront Pavilion. And if you are interested in going, please RSVP to Jamie. And I believe her phone number is not up there. Do you want me to give out your phone number, Jamie? It's uh, 330-221-1033, because they need a head count for food. Reminders that Joni and friends, um, the Kleins and Nicewangers are going to be helping two different weeks, correct, Bob? Yeah. And they have the total amount that they need to raise is, I think, 5500 And they've raised a bunch of money so far with the help of the church and missions, and 3800 is still needed. And we just really, they really support your generosity as a church. Another reminder today, the softball game versus Friendship Bible Church at 2 p.m. Also, RSVP 
Rosemary for Alliance Pregnancy Banquet by May 26th, which is this Thursday. No children's church next Sunday. Kids will be worshiping with us in here. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Sign-ups. You should have a sign-up sheet in your bulletin. Um, I'll just let you look through that and figure out what you want to sign up for and how the Lord leads you. Shout-outs. Uh, Nancy Frank filled our nursery need. Thank you, Nancy, wherever you are. Joni and or Jared Collar built us a new, more powerful computer for our sound and streaming. Thank you, Jared. And then Mike Hetrick has tweaked it and is willing to train one of you uh, to be able to maintain it. One or more of you. Did you notice the landscaping when you came in? All the flowers and all that were planted over the weekend. We thank Susie and her team on Saturday. Uh, Pastor Joel prepped the Gaga Court. Is that how you say that? Gaga Ball, Gaga ball Court. Oh, is that what that oct octangular thing is out in the yard? And PK pulled weeds in the parking lot. Thank you, Pastor. <laughs> <clears throat> Praises. Aaron Hetrick's sermon last Sunday. It was it was powerful. I was here for that. Uh, the thing that just keeps coming to mind is he's the overthinker of overthinkers. <laughs> <clears throat> Some six hundred dollars was donated for the Kleins and Nicewangers ministry at Joni and Friends with the missions team earmarking another. $1,100, there's only $3,800 to go. We thank you once again, church. <clears throat> our Compassion Fund, this is another praise. Our Compassion Fund was able to help an area family get back in their home, and Holly Swanger is discipling them. Also, the church softball team won last week and helped other teams that were shorthanded. And that's just a, a great... Uh, show of sportsmanship right there. Now we're going to play a video for Johnny and Friends, and then I believe Bob is going to come up and say a few words. I'm just touched by the kids and 
you think you're serving them, but really, in reality, they're serving you much more than you could ever imagine. And it will be a stretching experience, and it will be a, it'll be a little difficult at times, but it will be so worth it. And going home is so hard because you leave a little piece of your heart here, and you have more of the love of Jesus each time you come, and I'm just so thankful for this opportunity. If you already have a God-given love for people uh, in your heart, I, I think you're ready. I would definitely recommend Johnny and Friends if somebody wants to serve. And the reason for that is it's completely life-changing. I mean, I've been to other camps, and they're really great, but there's something special about Johnny and Friends that you actually come to experience it. Yeah, so unforgettable, life-changing, special. Um, that's very true. Uh, I can testify to that as well. And I just want to just thank the church family one more time. Um, we put the need out last week, and you guys really, God really came through, through you guys in an amazing way. So I just want to praise the Lord for you guys and um, and for what you've done. And um, this is a, is a very, very powerful a um, couple weeks. Um, the first time I got involved because my wife was involved even prior to me meeting her. And so naturally I wanted to be a part of what she was doing. And um, when, I, when I got down there, um, I was just a small cog in the machine, right? But I, I got to see what God was doing. And I'm telling you what, God really, really moves. You know, all life is sacred and God speaks through every life. And um, you just you just um, feel God's presence in a, in a in a powerful way, and God really really moves in those families. So it's a it's a very powerful ministry. I thank you guys guys once again for your support. Um, there is still a, a little bit of a of a financial need yet for the second week, I believe. Um, so just uh, you know, God is laying that on your heart, but um, know that 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 uh, is a going to a, a ministry that God is, is just, that God is there, and God is using those people. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Let's open up to Galatians chapter 2. I'm just going to talk for a couple minutes about uh, our identity in Christ. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20 is going to be the scripture I'm going to read in a couple minutes here. <clears throat> is anybody familiar with the term tomboy? Anybody? Raise your hand if you're familiar with that term. I think it's a term that was recognized in my generation and maybe a, a little older. Um, my wife was a class A tomboy back in her teen years and early 20s. She was, was brought up in a family with three girls, but she was daddy's boy. Uh, not in reality, but figuratively. So she loved to fish and hunt. Uh, she got under the cars with her dad and got her hands greasy, tearing them apart. Um, she loved G.I. Joe. She hated Barbies and dolls that her sisters loved. In fact, her G.I. Joe beat up the Barbie all the time. <laughs> And so <clears throat> she was a class A tomboy. I never hear that term used anymore. And it was basically things that, you know, a tomboy was somebody, a girl, that liked to do stuff that typically was categorized by boys. Not always, but they were just termed as tomboys. Now, Pam did not claim to be a boy. <laughs> Uh, she was just a girl that liked to do boy stuff. Her parents did not talk her in, talk her about transitioning, um, changing body parts. Um, I think you could say today in this world we have a serious identity crisis going on. <clears throat> Lots of people out there are confused uh, 
about changing parts and transitioning and not really realizing that God created them a certain way for a certain purpose in time. I am a uniquely and wonderfully made person. You are uniquely made and wonderfully made person. There will never be another person in history, past, present, or future, that is created like me. That is a, that's an awesome thought. <laughs> and the same thing for all of you. There will never be another person like you. A true identity shift, let's read this scripture. So Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, 20, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So a true identity shift is no longer, once you become a Christian, you're no long, I'm no longer living for self or self-indulgence. I am now living for Christ first. A real identity shift is not about transitioning or changing body parts, but changing who I serve with the parts that God has given me and the way he has created me and for the purpose that he has given me in this life. Father, we thank you, Lord, that we are all created for a purpose. I pray, Lord, that you would show us, all of us, the purpose that we have, that you have for us, for our time here on this earth. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's let's stand and begin our worship this morning. You know, we are uniquely created by God. We are unique, and we were created to worship Him and created to glorify Him. Sometimes it's easy not we're not able to see God clearly when He's there. We're just going to ask the Lord this morning as we sing this first song that he will open up our eyes, the eyes of our heart, telescope our hearts so we can see him this morning. We are changed when we see him. We want to be changed. So we sing, that, sing the next song with me. Open the eyes of my heart.
be seated. Amen. Thank you, thank you, Lord. Lord, so neat with what you've given me to preach on. Vince talked about, you've just sung about, and so you're here. You're doing a work. Lord, we open ourselves up to you. We give ourselves to you. It's the best place we can be. Thank you. Love you. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. If you want, turn in your bulletin, because, well, we have scripture reading that's taken out there, and you who are streaming you can look on that at, on our website. Um, I'm going to tell you a true story about Jerry Nichols. <laughs> Boy, I got everybody's attention on that, yeah, our own Jerry Nichols. Um, he was in an adult Sunday school class, and people in the class were talking about Kairos, the prison minister. And Jerry noticed that when they would talk about Kairos, the sun would shine through the window. And then the conversation would go another direction, and then the sun would stop shining. And then they would start talking about the prison ministry again, the sun would shine, and they would stop talking about the prison ministry, and the sun would stop shining. And that happened three, four, five times. And finally, Jerry says, is anybody catching this? Have, have you noticed that the sun shines when we talk about Kairos, and it doesn't shine when we stop talking about Kairos? And nobody else... It's all that. And somebody said, Jerry, I think God's speaking to you. And Jerry, I don't know how old you were. You were in your late 70s, I think. And Jerry stretched himself, listened to God, joined God in what he is doing. That's the kingdom. His kingdom is good. It's right. It's pure. It's love. It's joy. It's life. We need to get in on it, amen? So let's stand up and read how God describes his own kingdom. It's so neat. Matthew 9, Jesus went through the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the, say it with me, kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. He showed that the kingdom was real. He showed that the kingdom was doing things. Matthew chapter 10, and he's talking to us. As you go, proclaim this message. Say it with me. The kingdom, the kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead. Please give us Lord, more faith, Lord. Cleanse those who have leprosy. Drive out demons. Freely you've received, freely give. We're just have the same kind of ministry as Jesus. Romans 14, for the kingdom the kingdom of God is not a matter of rules about eating and drinking, but it's about righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. 1 Corinthians 4, for the kingdom. The kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. And then Revelation 12, then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. Father, in Jesus' name, Help us to get into the kingdom, to believe and into Jesus, to keep trusting, keep believing, keep repenting. Lord, help us get better at baptism and, and owning our faith and helping others to do the same and, and to produce fruit like John the Baptist taught. And, ah, Lord, your kingdom is where there's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Your kingdom is where there's life and love and forgiveness and power and healing. Lord, may your kingdom, like we pray in the Lord's Prayer, may your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, on earth, in our own hearts, minds, on earth, in our families, on earth, in our jobs, on earth, in our governments and societies and communities, Lord. Lord, wherever you're not reigning, help us get in and bring you down. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Let's do it. This is God's word. This is God's word. It's God's authority over me. It's God telling me who I am and then what to do. I'll read it, obey it, and share it to be close to Jesus and to bring others to Jesus and give each other a good kingdom nudge or something 
take a seat. So the Lord's led me to preach on the kingdom. And what's it like? It, it's, it's full of love, joy, peace, power, goodness, kindness, healing. And what we've seen so far is uh, the first sermon, I tried to define the kingdom. And as I've been wrestling with these scriptures, my definition's gotten bigger. Now, ultimately, the kingdom is wherever God reigns. Are you with me? Wherever he reigns, and he is king. Now, there's four time zones. He's eternally king. He always was king. He always will be king. He is king now. But there's two other time zones, and that is there's the kingdom here and now. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done. And then there's the future kingdom that's right around the corner. Jesus is going to come back. And he's going to set up his kingdom on earth the, in, in the thousand-year reign. But what's interesting as I meditated on this is that now, until Jesus returns, he's inviting. He isn't. He's not inviting an eternity past. He's not going to invite an eternity future. It is over. Read the Gospels. They're absolutely scary where Jesus says, no, the door will be shut on you. No, I never knew you. Then it's too late. But he's not a stingy king. He says, go everywhere. Go into the, 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 the back roads and the alleys. Invite. I want my house to be full. He's an inviting king who wants everybody to come to the banquet, amen? But if you put him off, it's near, it's now, it's urgent. We have to make a decision. And this is just, this is just a new thought for me. So when his kingdom advances, that's when you really see the power. Have you noticed, and then I know some of you have experienced this, when you start doing something new for Jesus, all of a sudden the wheels start coming off, right? You, you, you start arguing more at home, or you start having trouble at work because Satan is trying to stop the advancement of the kingdom. And then have you ever noticed when you start doing something new for Jesus, you also feel his power more? Now, in America, we don't want tanks going up and down our street, do we? We don't want to see battalions of, of soldiers marching. I mean, we don't want to see that. But if we get attacked, we want to see that. You want the power to be where the front line is. You want more power? Jerry Nichols, I bet you you felt more power from Jesus when you got out of your comfort zone, right? That's where the power is. That's where he wants to pour it on. On that first sermon, too, talked about how the kingdom is key. And when you see that God is ruling, and he's ruling over the willing, but he's also inviting the unwilling, all of a sudden, that makes sense of everything. That's the kind of God we serve. You know the song, Reckless Love, which I'm not going to sing? Uh, no amens and thank yous. What in the world? There's no... Oh, there's no... Shadow you won't light up. There's no mountain you won't climb up coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down. Lie you won't tear down coming after me. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Help me. It fights for me. It leaves the 99. Wow. That's God. He's a king who wants more subjects willing subjects. Hallelujah. And then that makes sense of why then Jesus came down to, to bring his kingdom. It makes sense why Satan rebelled, because he didn't want to have a king over him. It makes sense of how the Bible is written. It's about his kingdom and how he advances, and it seems to get pushed back, and Satan advances, and then he gets pushed back, and on and on and on. But one day, Jesus is coming back. He just speaks the word. Satan's done. It makes sense of what salvation is. It's coming to the king. It's just not mental assent. It's believing in him and sitting in him. It's trusting in him. It makes sense of heaven and hell. We're going to get to reign with Jesus forever in a new heaven, new earth. But if you don't want that, you can have your kingdom, and you can have it for all eternity with millions of other people who want their kingdom too, just like you. Then we looked at 
last two weeks. Kingdom salvation. How do you get in? John the Baptist said, keep repenting. Keep a soft heart. Jesus said to Nicodemus, and keep believing in God's only son. And now we're going to look at kingdom power and the spheres of the kingdom. Turn with me to John chapter 5. This is page 1653 in your pew Bibles. John chapter 5, page 1653. How many of you have read Henry Blackaby or know about him experiencing God? Okay. The Lord gave us that like back in the 1990s. Absolutely incredible what that did for us as a church. And Henry Blackaby, I, I don't know there, if he's still living or not, but I know he, he, he's, he has dementia from the last time I heard. Uh, pastor of just a church of 120 people. And the impact he's had across the world. And it, God gave it to him from this passage, John chapter 5. Um, it's page again, 1653. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for a feast to the Jews. Now there in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate Pool, which in the Aramaic is called Bethesda. Now Bethesda is, means house of kindness. Interesting. Which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie. The blind, the lame, the paralyzed. And it, the waters would stir, like seemingly an angel would come down. If you could get in, you could get healed. Anyway. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked, do you want to get well? Now that's interesting too, isn't it? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water stirred. When I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. The day on which this took place was a Sabbath. And so the Jews said to the man who had been healed, it's the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, the man who made me well said to me, pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, who's this fellow who told you to pick it up and walk? The man who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. <laughs> Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, See, you're well again. Stop sinning, or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and repented. No, the man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. So because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jews persecuted him. Persecuted him. Jesus said to them, My father is always at work to this very day. You know, always at work. And I too am working. For this reason, the Jews tried all the harder to kill him, not only because he was breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Jesus gave them this answer, I tell you the truth, the son can do nothing by himself. Now that should remind you of John 15. Jesus says we can't do anything on our own. The son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his father doing. So Jesus is watching what the father's doing because whatever the father does, the Son also does. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all he does. Wow. So when Jesus goes to this pool, there's all kinds of people laying around who are blind, lame, and paralyzed, right? And yet he only heals one guy. I know he healed this one guy because this guy was a really nice guy. This guy really needed the healing and he deserved no, this guy's a jerk. He doesn't have any friends, and I wonder why. <laughs> yeah, I want to get healed, but nobody helps me. And, and so here's Jesus. He heals him. Oh, I get it. He's going to heal him, so that way this man's going to become a faithful follower and disciple. Nope. People say, oh, what are you carrying this matter around for? Uh, well, the guy who healed me, he told me to. I mean, this guy's blame-shifting. He doesn't take it. He's not like the blind man in John chapter 9. Well, I don't know. I know it's the Sabbath, and I don't know whether he's a sinner or not. All I know is I was blind. Now I see. You deal with it. You know? So this guy, he doesn't have any friends, I think for a reason. He turns Jesus in, but Jesus still heals him. You know why? Because Jesus is a good king who's inviting the unwilling. 
He wants all to come in. And even though Jesus knew this about this guy, he still goes to him and says, stop sinning. He's still warning. He's still giving them chances. How, you have a chance to know Jesus till the day you take your final breath. Please get to know Jesus. And so then Jesus gives us the principles. My father's always working. He's always working. Don't we sing? Okay, again, another song I won't sing. Um, he's working when we don't see him, even when we... Yeah, there's some, something like that. <laughs> the way he's a way maker, miracle, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. So that's who he is. He's all, and do you get discouraged sometimes? Does it, does it feel like God's not working? Remind yourself, he's always working. He's always working. And in the original language, the idea is he's working with energy. It's the word we get energy from. God's always working. And then Jesus says something phenomenal. I can't do anything on my own. You, you think I did this? No, I was following my father. I was, and, and daddy said, he's the guy. Heal him. Yes. God's always speaking. He's always working. And then he's inviting us to join him. Amen. And that's what Henry Blackaby taught the church worldwide. Don't ask God just to bless what you're doing. Look at what God's blessing. Join in where you see him working. That's where the kingdom is. Now, of course, then you have to say, well, then how can I know? Because Jesus gets the sense of, like, can't you see it? But I know the number one question of Christians is, number one, can I really know I'm saved? The number two question of Christians is, how can I know God's will? Now, let's, let's be honest. When do we ask that question, how can we know God's will? Well, when it comes to, should I ask Janet to marry me or not? Should I go to college or stay home? Should, should I move or should I take this? We, we want to know God's will when it's the big things, right? Uh, we kind of want to use him like a crystal ball, like the Lord, you know, like, do they still even make that, the, the crazy eight thing, the eight ball, you know, turn over, yes, no, maybe, you know, come on, Lord, okay, okay, can I do it again because I didn't like that answer, you know? <laughs> It's more than that. So let's turn the page. We're going to look at, and as I worked on this yesterday, I realized I bit off more than I can chew, so we're just going to do this page and stop. But there's seven signs that I think God uses to show us what his will is, to show us where he's working. And I'm using the acronym SWISH, you know, like the basketball, going SWISH right dead center into the basket. And the first... S is surrender. Surrender. Don't expect Jesus to show you his will if you are not surrendered. I just want God to show me what to do. Oh, just for this job? Or just for whether you should go to college? Amen. Please, seek the Lord on those things. But if that's all you're doing, you're missing it. Look at these scriptures, so neat. Proverbs chapter 3. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your paths straight. That's guidance. How will he make your path straight? When you trust in him with all your heart. When you don't lean on your own understanding and when you submit. Oh, there it is. When you submit to him. Oh, I was dealing with a situation where... I really felt the person needed to hire a detective. I mean, they were, they were dealing with some serious stuff. And they had spent so much time in prayer, and they said, nope, God's telling me he's going to show it all. And it's like, I appreciate your faith, but why don't we be wise? <laughs> Guess what? God revealed it all in a supernatural way. Hallelujah. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge, submit to him. And, and, and he'll make your path straight. Here's, a, here's another verse, very, very well known. Romans 12. And so, dear brothers and sisters, this is from the Living Translation. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies. There's the surrender. There's the submission. To give your bodies to God because 
of all he's done for you, his mercies. Let them be a living, your body, a living and holy sacrifice. That surrender, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then what's, here's the promise. Then you'll learn to know God's will. There it is again. You give yourself to God, and then he'll show you his will. If you don't know God's will, then ask the question, am I really submitted? Have I really surrendered? Because he says, you acknowledge him, he'll make his, your path straight. He says, you give yourself over to him, he will make his will known to you. There's a crazy scripture in Jeremiah 42. In Jeremiah, he's been prophesying, preaching. You guys are saying the temple of God, the temple of God, the temple of God. The Babylonians will never take us. Guess what? The Babylonians took them. And God removed his glory from the temple. And, and the Babylonians did two deportations, and the only people that were left were the, the very, very poor. And one of them killed the Jewish governor and the Babylonian uh, soldiers. And so the rest were very, very scared. What are the Babylonians going to do to us now? And they go to Jeremiah, just like we do, and said, Oh, Jeremiah, please seek the Lord for us. Pray to us. And tell us what we're supposed to do. They want to know God's will. And they say, this great, it's really a great statement. And we will do it, whether it's easy or whether it's hard. That should be our attitude, amen? Lord, whatever you say, we will do. And so Jeremiah prays, and it says he prayed for 10 days. And God gives him the answer. And the answer is, stay here. Here you will be safe. Here I will protect you. And you know what the people said? You're lying. God didn't tell you that. <laughs> like the eight ball. Oh, let's, let's get another answer. <sighs> Jesus put it very well, and that's tongue in cheek. In Mark chapter 9, Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it but whoever loses their life for me will find it. Do you hear the thing? I mean, we're getting from kind of gentle to harsh. We began in Proverbs chapter 3 of submit to him. All right? Is that okay? I surrender, Lord. When you get to Romans chapter 12, what is it? Present your bodies a what? Living sacrifice. You know what they did to sacrifices? You know, they, they tied the legs and they tied him to the horns of the altar. And then they took a knife. And they slit the throat. Okay. Sometimes when you get on the altar, it hurts. I mean, doesn't it? Sometimes it hurts like the dickens. Like, Lord, do you really want me to do this? Please, no, 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 no. Right? Now, Jesus takes it even further. A living sacrifice, at least they don't slit the throat. But even if they do slit the throat, it's kind of a gentle death. If you're going to get killed, it's... A nice way to go. What does Jesus say? Take up your what? That's not fun. And it's long and it's drawn out and it's excruciating. Sometimes you have to just keep getting back up on the Lord, help me, help me, help me submit. Kill that sinful nature. So I want to end with a gentle verse. Are you ready? Psalm 23. And it's the same thing. The Lord's my shepherd, I shall not want, my right? living translation, I have all that I need. Now, isn't that good? If God's your shepherd, you have all. Now, now, when you think of shepherds, what do you think of? You just think of you know, the idyllic thing, and he's, he's scaring that shepherd's crook, you know. What does he use the shepherd's crook for? Stop! No! Get back! <laughs> And I don't know if you know, what does the next verse say? He makes me lie down. Well, I'm sorry, what, what word is that? He makes me lie down in green pastures. Sheep don't like to lie down, just like you and I don't. Sheep just want to keep moving. And the shepherd uses the staff and goes, stop. 
or laying down. You want his direction? Then let him make you. <laughs> Is he your Lord? I'm going to stop and pray. Father, oh Lord, from the shepherd's crook to the cross, to the altar of sacrifice, to our own hearts, we submit ourselves to you. Not my will, like Jesus prayed, but your will be done. Your will be done in all areas of our lives. We pray. Thank you. In Jesus' name. First, S, swish, surrender. Second, the W, God's word. I, this was a very distressing conversation I had with a church person. I mean, they godly. Uh, they were leaders, and we were, I forget what the issue was. We were, we were talking about something, and then they made this statement to me. They said, well, God hasn't convicted me of that yet. And I didn't answer well in the moment, and I wish I would have said, is what we're talking about in the Bible? Oh, Yeah. So God says not to do this thing, but you're saying the Holy Spirit hasn't convicted you of that yet, so that therefore you don't need to do this? Is that what you're saying? You're putting your conviction over God's word, like you're holier and you're so spiritual, and you're disobeying his word because you don't want to be legalistic. You follow the spirit, not the letter of the law, when God's written it in black and white? Are you serious? Are you, are you with me? If I'm not convicted by this, what, who, where's the problem? <laughs> Lord, help me. Soften my heart. Joshua chapter 1. And again, this shows God's, how he wants to lead us into the kingdom. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you'll be prosperous and successful. Read it again. Keep the book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that it may, you may be careful to do, to obey everything written in it. Then you'll be prosperous and successful. Who doesn't want to be prosperous and successful? <gasps> Then read this. How many of us struggle with reading the Bible every day, right? And how many of us struggle knowing God's will? Interesting. And as you read God's word, he's going to lead you through it in a couple different ways. He's going to lead you through it morally um, with obedience. Oh, I'm not supposed to grumble. Lord, help me not grumble. Oh, I'm not supposed to gossip. Well, Lord, help me stop God. Right? That, that's, that's him leading you. And then there's kind of like more of an individual leading. When I first came here, I had a seminary friend, man, this guy, he, he was a beast and worked out and all that. And he said, we Americans eat wrong and, you know, we eat protein at night and then just sits in our stomach and all that. You need to eat your protein in the morning to give you all day and, and eat like salads and stuff at night. So I'm doing that, but I'm having all kinds of intestinal problems. And uh, Jen, I, I think this was in our devotions. We were, like, I guess reading through the Bible. And, um, or maybe she, maybe she was reading uh, before she went to bed. And she was in Exodus 16 or so. And it says, and God fed them manna in the morning and quail at night. And Jen, it goes, so... Mr. Pastor, sir, she didn't do that. Um, what did they eat in the morning? Manna. What did they eat at night? Quail. So they ate their meat at night and their carbs in the morning. Interesting. Guess what? God. Now, did God write that so that Ken Baker, two and a half thousand years later, would change his diet? Was that, is that the meaning of that verse? Yes! <laughs> Hallelujah, God's that big! Now, that's not the main point. That's not the only point, hallelujah. But, but have you ever been reading the Bible and it seems like a verse jumps out at you? That could be the Holy Spirit saying, pay attention. I, I, I forget the 
uh, the exact circumstances, but this lady had um, cancer. It did not look good at all. She's reading through her Bible, and she came to, in the Psalms where it says, open your mouth wide, and you will live. And she felt that verse. That's me. And guess what? She got cured. Hallelujah. So God's word, use it for what it's made for, but he'll also speak to you in private. And notice, please, the timing. Sometimes the timing is so great. It was back in um, seminary, and I was a security guard at, at a bank, and I don't know, there was like eight, ten different uh, employees, and they were going to have a party. Now, Jen and I were from a very conservative Baptist background, and you don't go to parties. They drink and smoke and do other things. But they invited me, and Jen and I had real words about it, that, honey, that I, I, I feel like we need to be a witness, but from our background, no, you're not supposed to go there. You're going to be a bad witness if you go to a party like that. And so we had a pretty good, strong argument over it. And I worked at night, and um, she, had her, she had her Bible reading that night. And the next day she said, you'll never believe where I was last night in the Bible. I think it was Matthew 9, about Jesus eating with the, fair, or eating with the tax collectors and sinners. I guess God's saying you're right. <laughs> Hallelujah. Get in the word. Please, at least for this next week. Can you make the promise? Okay, Lord, I'm going to try. Just a chapter. Can you do that? Or text me and I'll get you the Bible app. It is wonderful. I mean, I have read through the Bible now consistently last year, and I'm up to date as of today even. It's just, oh. So God, swish, surrender, get into the word. Now this is going to be a little bit opposite. Use wisdom. And here's where Scripture is balanced, and it's a little tricky. I mean, Proverbs chapter 3 says, Trust the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. Okay, well, then I guess I don't have to worry about what I think. God doesn't always do things with common sense. I mean, it really didn't make sense to call Abraham when he was 75 years old and couldn't have kids anymore to leave his family and to... <laughs> Start a fr- wait, wait, did that make sense? No. It really didn't make sense for God to call Moses when he was 80 and then go through all those plagues and then lead him to the Red Sea boxed in. That didn't make sense. Didn't make sense to walk through some hundred feet of water and it didn't, make, it didn't make sense when God told Joshua, I want you to march around this first city seven times. Sometimes God doesn't make sense. And we need to put our common sense underneath his spirit. But we don't throw away common sense either. Because he wrote the book of Proverbs for us. Pay attention to your ways. Consider the condition of your flock. Look at the ant and how he works. Uh, Great verses. Jesus, Luke chapter 2, Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and all the people. Jesus grew in what? In wisdom, in common sense. Proverbs chapter 4, don't forsake wisdom and she will protect you. Love her and she will watch over you. Again, there's that idea of wisdom will protect you and guide you. Um, There was a lady who had great faith, great faith. And I mean, if you had a problem, you would want her to pray for you. You know what I'm saying? And she also could not hear out of her, I forget whether it was her right or her left ear, but she just couldn't hear well. And so she's praying, Lord, please, you know, and God's used her to, to heal other people, and, and yet she's not getting any healing in herself. And so her friends kept saying, go to the doctor, go to the doctor, go to the doctor. And she's thinking, no, that's not of faith. God's going to heal me. God's going to heal me. Well, God didn't heal her. So she went to the doctor. Doctor looked at her ear full of earwax. 
<laughs> Sometimes God does stuff miraculously. Sometimes he says, could you use a Q-tip? <laughs> it's both. It takes practice. Uh, swish, surrender. Get into the word. Get common sense. And lastly, look at the image. I, I like Rick Warren's acronym. I think it's very helpful. And, and uh, um, Vince, you said it this morning. There's never going to be anybody like you. Never Was there anybody like you for all of eternity? God made you, you. Maybe he's trying to talk to you through that. What do you like to do? What do you think? What do you feel? Do it. Newt Larson from the chapel said, you know, and you can, and if you want, I can get you some spiritual gift tests. But he says, to me, spiritual gift tests are these questions. What do you like to do? Do it for Jesus and others. I mean, if you like to, to plant flowers, please, we can use you. Plant flowers. If you hate plant, planting flowers and you like a chainsaw, please show up and we have a chainsaw party. Oh, yeah. Huh? Oh, yeah. What do you like to do? And so shape, S, what are your spiritual gifts? What do you like to do for Jesus and others? H, what's your heart? Where are, what's your passion? What are your hot buttons? What brings you joy? A, what are your abilities? God gave you those abilities for a reason. P, what's your personality? Are you an upfront person or behind the scenes person? Are you high energy or are you more laid back? God wants to use your personality as you are. And so like this illustration, God's called us all to share our faith, right? Now, if you're an extrovert, you can do that with complete strangers at a gas station. It comes easy to us extroverts. If you're an introvert, oh, I'll never do that. Ah, but you're good at sharing your faith quietly with a friend over coffee. Same gift, but the person different ways. And then E, experiences. Goodness sakes, if you used to have addictions and God's helped you, maybe you can help other people with addictions. If you lost your spouse, maybe you can help somebody else who, who's going through grief. If you've had a rough childhood, maybe you can help somebody who's had a... Do you know what I'm saying? What is your shape? There's a, a guy who just loved to water ski, and he got saved, and he thought, well, that's it for water skiing for me, you know, because he would do that on the weekends. And his church said, not so fast. How could you use that for Jesus? And so he started having, you know, people coming over and teaching them to water ski, and then he began giving camps for the youth group and it was the highlight of the summer for these teens. They would get to water ski. People come and know Christ because of this. What do you like to do? Vincent, remind me when you shared your, um, you, you are you and you are you for a reason. The rabbis tell the story of Rabbi Cohen standing before God and saying to God, I am sorry I was not more like Moses. And God says, I'm sorry you were not more like Rabbi Cohen. Now, we're going to stop there, and I want to switch gears. But I want you to turn to Psalm 128. If you want to hear a really good sermon on this, get on Right Now Media, uh, Tony Evans, The Kingdom. And it's called The Spheres of the Kingdom, and it's based upon this verse, our passage, Psalm 128. So we, we, we've looked at four signs so far. Surrender, the word, wisdom, the image of God. And when we think of God's will, we tend to think of, okay, that's what I do at church, or that's what I do with Bible reading. Amen. It is that, but it's all of life. God has spheres of the kingdom. Spheres. He, he wants to bring his kingdom into every area. And, and look at this in Psalm 128. Blessed are all who fear the Lord. There we're starting out with submit, respect him, stand in awe of him. Blessed are all who fear the Lord, who walk in his ways, obey him. You will eat the fruit of your labor. Fear number one is you, our heart. Fear him. Fear number two, your what? Your labor. 
your job, your occupation, your income. I mean, some of you, you're going through some tough stuff on your job. God's, God wants to bring his kingdom down to that. Blessings and prosperity will be yours. God cares about our finances. I want to let me stop there for a second. It really struck me. This was, I think, 2014 when we did uh, the Financial Peace University for the first time. And if you don't have $1,000 in your savings, if you don't have $1,000 in your savings, your chances of divorce goes up. See, this is God's kingdom. He wants to invade your finances where you learn not to spend everything you get, where you learn to get out of debt, where you learn to, to go to the ant and save up for future expenses. He wants that. That's part of his kingdom. Now, now think about this. With inflation being 8 to 9% right now, do you think we might be seeing some marital problems coming? Help us, Lord. Lord, please bring your kingdom down. Please help them to figure out this thing with inflation. Please. So, so God wants to bless us in the sphere of ourselves. He wants to bless us in the sphere of our labor. Oh, next verse, verse 3. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine. Now, I don't know what that means for us in um, modern day. She's going to be fruitful. She's going to be a vine. She's going to be growing. She's going to be prospering, a fruitful vine within your house. Your sons will be like olive shoots around your table. Woo! Now, olive trees take, I forget how long, they, they take decades before they can bear fruit. So be patient with your children. Might take some decades. Thus is the man blessed who fears the Lord. He's blessed in the sphere of himself, of his job, of his family. And then it goes on, may the Lord bless you from Zion all the days of your life. Now, Zion could mean Jerusalem, but it probably is specifically talking about where the temple was. Wait a minute. God wants to bless me, me. He wants to bless me in my job. He wants to bless me in my family. He wants to bless me in my church. His kingdom needs to be there too. Hallelujah. Oh, one of the things I love about New Baltimore, and, and people, especially even new people, they'll say, you, kinda, you feel like God's working here. Yeah. Blessings. May the Lord bless you from Zion all the days of your life, and may you see the prosperity of Jerusalem. Wait a minute. God wants to bless us in the family, or ourselves. He wants to bless us in our work. He wants to bless us in our family. He wants to bless us in our church. Now he wants to bless us from Washington, D.C. Oh, we need some blessing, don't we? Oh, Lord, please bless, bring your kingdom down. We need it in our Jerusalem, in, in our wife. We need it politically. We need it in our community. And then it says, and may you live to see your children's children. Hallelujah. Peace be upon Israel, the whole nation, the whole world. Now, I can't do it the way Tony Evans does. But he says, so if you are a messed up man, you're going to have a messed up job, a messed up family, a messed up church, a messed up community, a messed up county, a messed up state, a messed up nation, and a messed up world. God wants to bring his kingdom down to every one of those areas. Where's God calling you to be a kingdom saint? Personally, at your job, in your family, at church, in your community and world, amen? What do you want to do? Do it! And I'm just going to ask you a couple questions. It's actually asking you the same thing, but maybe one question will trigger you more than the other. Think about yourself, your job, your family, your church, your community. What do you feel God might be telling you? What, like Jerry Nichols, are you kind of afraid he might be saying? There you go. 
If you could do anything for God, anything for God, and be promised you wouldn't fail or be made fun of, he's just going to hold you. He's going to put the training wheels on. He's going to stand right behind you on that bike. If you could do anything for God and not fail, what would it be? What is eating your lunch? What is frustrating you? That might be the finger of God saying, you know, Ken, you need to clean up your office. And I do. <laughs> what is it? If you only had one month to live. Now, if I would tell you, you're going to die tonight, then that's too frenetic. I mean, uh, what would you do if you knew you were going to die tonight? Now, that's, uh, you, that, that's not enough time. If you had a whole month, they found that when people... You know, you got cancer, we give you one month to live. People start doing significant things. I have nothing else to lose. I need to talk to my neighbor about Jesus. Yeah. Father, in Jesus' name, your kingdom come, your will be done. Lord, speak to us now through your spirit. First of all, Lord, we surrender ourselves to you. Hmm. living sacrifices on the cross, crucified with him. Lord, we give you the keys of our car, <laughs> our house, our finances, our life. You are Lord, we are not. And you're a good king. Lord, we pray, speak to us through your word. Help us to get into it better. Maybe a verse is coming to mind or something. God speaking to you. Lord, give us common sense and stand in the image that you have made us to be. Lord, I pray your kingdom come, your will be done in our personal lives, in our jobs, in our family, in our church, in our community, Lord. Help us to be like Jerry Nichols. Help us to see the signs. And then obey, we pray. And if you don't know Jesus, he is a good shepherd. He died for you. He rose again. He's coming back. Get to know him. Bow your knee to him. Say, Lord Jesus, take over. I want to be one of yours. I believe you died and you did rise again to bring me into your kingdom. Lord, bless us now as we sing. Advance your kingdom in our hearts. Thank you, Lord. It's where the joy is and the love and the peace, the purpose, the direction. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Um, Rosemary, if you would come up and pray for the ladies and Joel for the men, and let's stand up and worship our God.
Oh, go ahead and grab shoulders or arms, elbows. So neat. Bob, did you pick the songs this week? Tell me, for some of the points that the Lord gave me is that God's running after us, and we just sang that, and then about surrendering, and that I, you know, I, I stand with abandon, you know, heart abandon and arms up. Let's pray. Mm. Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you. You are with us in force. And help us to join you in what you are doing. Lord, we, we pray uh, for Jessica Bauman's mom having appendix surgery you know, right sometime here during the service. Protect her, Lord. Bring your kingdom down. Marty Husted, uh, Anita said last week how they've been married for 45 years, and he has different, really huge things, cancer. We, we pray when he, he goes in for the, the biopsy this week. Give the doctors wisdom. Thank you for uh, Marty's spirit. Strengthen him both physically and spiritually, we pray. Lord, we did talk about our Jerusalem, Washington, D.C., please bring your kingdom down. Help Republican and Democrat to do what's best for the nation, to also work with an attitude of forgiveness and helpfulness. Lord, help us too with just things are so tense in our country now. That's not your kingdom. <laughs> we know which kingdom that is from. Lord Jesus, thank you that you are an inviting king, a seeking, serving, running after us. Hallelujah. Uh, help our hearts to stop and be found. Pray together with me. Uh, then the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not to temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen amen love you guys uh joel are you fields look okay are we still on for two Okay, so 2 o'clock, and, and bless you all. I mean, it was so neat to see not just the team win, but helping other teams. I, I, that meant so much. Who did that? Jesus. What's he like? He's big. How big? This big. Let's bless each other. Could you lead us some?